Hey there guys and welcome back. On this week's show, we're going to be working at the scroll saw. Well, I haven't done a scrolling video in a while and uh, it would seem that there might be a need for it out there. I've had some requests asking about scrolling tips and what have you. So I'm going to start with today uh, with a beginner's lesson, kind of an introduction to scrolling. Um, I don't know if it'll be one part, two part. I don't know how long it'll last, but I'll just go with it and see where it, where it takes us. Um, but without further ado, let's head over to the scroll saw. So you've got your new scroll saw and you are happy with it. You don't know um, much about it, but you're wondering where to go from here. Uh, well, this video is a good place to start. And where I'm going to concentrate to start off with here is the setup of your saw. Yeah, there's a few things you need to consider. Um, are you going to be scrolling while standing? Are you going to be scrolling while sitting? That sort of thing. For me, I prefer to sit. One of the important things about scrolling is that you want to be comfortable. If you're not comfortable and you're hunched over the saw and your back is aching, you're not going to produce a good product. So for here, I'm going to concentrate on, for me, sitting. And you can see that where this table is and where my chair height is, my forearms are pretty much straight across. It's a good, comfortable resting position. I'm not like this, where after scrolling for a while, there's no blood running to my fingers. And I'm not downwards, where it's a little bit unnatural. We're just sitting in a nice, easy position. And our forearms are pretty much running parallel with the table. Um, some people prefer to have the table tilted in this manner so that they're kind of looking down on it and that's fine too. The way that mine is set up with this parallel forearms thing, that's my preference. So the important thing to do is for you to play around with it a bit and to decide exactly what it is that you are comfortable with and what position is most comfortable for you to be sawing in. So that takes care of your saw height. And obviously, if you're going to be standing, the height is going to be different than if you're sitting. Um, the next thing that you really want to think about here is whether or not you have your saw on a stand. And I would highly recommend it simply because having it on a bench um, without that saw being bolted down securely to something, regardless of how many rubber feet you've got on the bottom, that thing is going to vibrate and move. Or while pushing your stock through, even though you don't intend to, there's a huge possibility that you're going to be pushing that saw with the vibrations and the force of you pushing the stock into it. So I would suggest having it on a stand. And you want to make sure that your saw is securely bolted to that stand. If once on the stand, there are things like excessive tool vibration, etc., 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 you can minimize that by putting rubber washers between the feet of your saw and the stand itself. That's fine. That's something to modify later. But first and foremost, this saw sh should be rock solid on a stand and not be able to in any way, shape or form vibrate off of that stand. Whether it's a commercial one like what I have here that came with my saw or whether you make one, it's something that you want to consider in your design element is stability and the ability for this to be bolted down solidly. The next thing I want to address is the throat clearance in your saw. Um, this is the hole in your table that the blade goes through. And it never really occurred to me prior to a few days ago um, when a viewer contacted me because 
a brand new saw, this blade was actually touching the edge of the table. And it occurred to me that, you know, new babies get sick too. So um, what we need to do is check your table's alignment. And what I mean by that is that this blade, when under tension, should be dead center, left to right, on the, uh, or in, in the gap here, or the blade hole of your table. If it's not, you need to loosen your table mountings and shift that table left or right, whatever you require, in order to get that mounted correctly. It doesn't mean you've got a crap saw. It doesn't mean that you have a problematic saw. What it means is a scroll saw is like any other tool and they don't necessarily come perfectly calibrated right out of the box. So there might be, and most likely will be, adjustments that are, are required to be made after you actually assemble this thing. Who knows what kind of bumping it took on the way there to get to the store and then to you. Who knows, uh, the guy that put that table on that day may have had a pretty rough night the night before. You don't know. These are things that you want to check. So, blade in the center of your clearance on your table. The next thing you want to consider now is whether or not your blade is square to the table. Without the blade being square to the table at 90 degrees too, for those of you who say, what the heck does he mean by square? You're, you're making a crooked cut. And if you're cutting a line, while thinner stock, it may not make a difference. I say may not. The thicker you go, the more that line is off on the opposite end of the stock. So you're now no longer cutting your true pattern. So you want to make sure that this blade is square. And the way you would do that is with a trusted little square. I have a small two inch one that lives in the, the drawers of the scroll saw. And you just want to take your arms uh, regardless of what mechanism you have here, you want to raise the blade up to its highest point and just place your square along the side of the blade. Don't push it in so that you're deflecting the blade. That's a lot, that's a mistake that some people make. Uh, you got to remember this is, doesn't have the thickness and, and the uh, rigidity of a table saw blade. It will bend, it will flex. So you just want to place that square up against the side of the blade not the teeth on the side of the blade and have a look. You can put a flashlight behind it if you like. You can just eyeball it, but you want to see that that is perfectly square there, that there is no deviation. There is no lines coming out of there. Everything is hunky-dory. If not, if it's out of square, even just by a little bit, take the extra time to square that blade up. Whether you have one that your table tilts or whether you have one that the whole motor and arm mechanism tilts doesn't matter square the blade up once you get it square you can get a solid piece of wood with nice flat square edges and run the blade into it just to make a notch and you can use that in future for a setup block if you like but i prefer my little square here and it's just a quick glance to see yes this is in square, it's going to give me a nice, clean, square edge cut. The next thing I want to touch on for the beginners is blade selection. Uh, I'm not going to get too deeply into blade selection. Just be aware there are many different types of blades and they do have um, different thicknesses that they can cut. For my personal preference, and again, this is my preference, quick breakdown would be a number two blade would be anything up to three-eighths of an inch. If it's having problems with a three-eighths due to a harder um, species, I might move up to a number three. Uh, a number five blade or a number three blade, I would use a number three for three-eighths of an inch up to half an inch. 
If it's having problems with a half an inch, I might bump it up to a five. And finally, I would use a number seven for anything, say five eighths of an inch, three quarters, seven eighths. Um, if, if the number seven bit can't take it, then you know, uh, you may need to go up to a number nine or a number 12, but that's pretty rare for me. Usually the number seven blades can take it. Speaking of blades, there are different types. There are spiral, there are skip tooth, there are reverse tooth. My preference is reverse tooth. And a reverse tooth blade has teeth that uh, are all pointing down as in a normal scroll saw blade, but at the bottom of the blade, it has about an inch of teeth that point up. So it will cut on the downstroke and then cut again on the upstroke. It just helps to reduce the tear out. It's just my personal preference. So figure out what thickness of stock that you are going to use and choose your blade accordingly. You've got the table centered up, you've got the scroll saw mounted, you've chosen your blade, and now comes the time to mount your blade. Guys, you should be practicing mounting these blades without ever having to look down under here. Um, looking underneath the table is just gonna slow you down, although scrolling is not a speed game, it's a real pain in the neck to have to bend and look under here all the time. So. Practice doing the blade without looking. And you should be able to just install the blade down through your throat plate hole, give it a little tighten, and then without even looking under there, attach it and then tension your blade. Um, the, the method for putting the blade is just like I just pointed out. Just place your blade down through. You want to get it so that it's lined up with your retaining bolt and then, or whatever mechanism yours has, and then give it a little tighten. You don't crank this. This here, most of these front pieces are aluminum, some are steel, but if you go cranking this, this bolt is eventually gonna strip out your retaining screw. You don't wanna strip that out. It's a real pain in the neck to have to rethread or order the new uh, part. It's a real pain. You don't wanna have to do that. You just give it a little snug. That's all it needs. You don't need anything else. If you're finding that your blade slips out, you can um, give it a little light sanding just to make sure there are no factory oils on it and to give it a little uh, rougher surface for these retaining bolts to bite into. But you shouldn't have that sort of issue. I have a number three blade here and I've talked so much that I forgot where I was in the blade installation, but you just want to line it up, give it a little tighten, just a touch, and then at the bottom, without looking, a little touch, and then tension. That's it. Blades installed. Simple as that. So now what about blade tension? If this blade is loose, there's going to be serious deflection. You're not going to get a good clean cut. You're going to break blades. It's not going to work for you. But if you pluck it, hear that? There's not a certain note you're going for. What you're going for is a high pitched tone, almost like a guitar string. It has to have tension. And that's a pretty good tone right there. If you don't have that, let me see if I can uh, duplicate a loose blade here. Hear that? Hear how low that is? It doesn't... You really want more tension than that. So get the blade in there, tensioned, a nice tone. That's what you need, a high pitched tone, just like a guitar string. If you don't have that amount of tension on there, um, if you're running a, a DW788, a DeWalt scroll saw, your tensioning is in the front up here. Just put a little more tension on it. If you're one of these, there are ways to adjust the tension at the back of the saw uh, with the knob that's back there. Um, these should be factory set uh, for the tension on this particular model, but you can tweak it and adjust it as you wish. 
So a nice tone on there, some nice tension, and then you're ready to cut. All right, you're ready to go. So now what? Where do you start? Um, most people who um, start off with the scroll saw, they want to jump right into these crazy intricate patterns and these fancy designs. And um, let, me, let me tell you something. For many years, the scroll saw was not even considered as part of woodworking. Um, it was considered uh, to be at the bottom of the food chain when it came to that uh, to the whole woodworking world. But scrolling is is a skill. It, it is a skill. It is much harder than it looks. Trust me. It is, uh, it is a skill that is improved and obtained by years of practice. Um, nobody is ever good at it from the get-go. Nobody can ever cut perfect lines. Nobody can ever follow a pattern to the T. It's just not going to happen. If you are one of the uh, one in a trillion people that can do it right off the bat, well, good for you. But the other guys can't. So take your time. There's no need to rush into these intricate patterns. You want to start off by practicing the basics. And all I've done is I googled scroll saw uh, practice cutting page or something like that and I got something that looks like this and uh, there it is and what this is it's a layout pattern I don't know where this one came from or what site or who designed it I don't really care it's just a page that you can use to practice your methods of scrolling but before you do that how do you get this pattern onto the wood? And that's where we're going to move next. Attaching your patterns. Well, every scroller has their preferred method of pattern attachment. Um, some people like to take painter's tape and lay it down on the board first. What that does, of course, is um, it makes the pattern easier to remove down the road when you go to take it off. And I find that that method works just fine um, on not so intricate patterns. Uh, I find that the pattern likes to lift off when you're cutting more intricate things, like more intricate fretwork. Um, other people like to um, just, you know, stick it down um, like with packing tape over the top of it to hold it down, I don't like that method at all. I, I, I think that the method that works best for me, and in my opinion, is get yourself a can of spray adhesive. And uh, whether you put the painter's tape down first or what have you, um, you still need to use spray adhesive. And for my liking, I like to give the pattern a good, generous coating of spray adhesive on the back of it and then I let it tack up for three minutes. Why three minutes? Because that's how I found it works the best for me. So I let it sit for three minutes, I let it tack up and then I rub it down onto the wood. Now if you want to coat your wood first in painter's tape so that you're actually adhering it to the um, painter's tape, that's fine too. But for my liking, I like to go straight to the wood. I get better adhesion, and on some of the really intricate stuff that I cut, that pattern does not lift off while I'm cutting. Depending on how intricate the fretwork is, sometimes there's not a mater enough material left behind to hold that pattern down steadily. So try some different methods and try what's best for you. Um, you want to make sure that that pattern is held down really well. If you're cutting thicker material after you lay down your pattern, and by thicker I mean one inch and up, or even three quarters for the harder species, you can lay clear packing tape down on top of your pattern after you have used spray adhesive to put it onto your wood. And what that does is it the uh, adhesive and the 
tape actually act as a lubricant and it keeps your blade running cool and it will help to prevent blade breakage and overheating of your blade. Well, there is our practice cutting pattern applied to, in this case, it's a piece of quarter inch thick uh, hardboard. And it's just to practice. And uh, my printer on my computer kind of crapped out on me, so I ended up having to draw over these lines in pen as best I could. So they're not as crisp as what I would like. Um, now that brings me to a point that if you're making your own patterns, you want to make your cut lines that you're drawing as thin as you can. If you're making them too thick, say with a black magic marker or, or something like that, what side of that line do you cut on? You're not going to get any crisp consistency in your cutting because you unless you choose which side of your line to go. You really want a nice, thin, sharp line to be able to follow. Um, another thing too, um, with the spray adhesive, one little tip I have, those spray nozzles, they can and will gum up. So what I do is I have a small uh, jar that has some mineral spirits in it and I keep the nozzle from the spray can in the mineral spirits and um, it just keeps them clean and keeps them from tacking up and when I go through one can of spray adhesive I keep the nozzle and that goes in the jar as well so I've always got a couple nozzles uh, clean and ready to go at a moment's notice and I just keep them in that jar you saw that I use this little card scraper thing just to rub down the pattern. It gets all the bubbles out on larger patterns and uh, goes a long way to getting really good adhesion on here. Now, all of these pictures or patterns here that we're going to attempt to cut, um, these are all inside cuts. You can see that they're inside the board. I don't start from an edge anywhere. I'm actually inside. So you're going to have to drill something that's called a blade entry hole. And you need a hole that is big enough for your blade to go through, but not so big that it is this eyesore in your cutting. And um, if it's in a waist area, it doesn't matter what size. But if it's going to show, you want a nice small hole. Preferably, from my liking, it's usually 1 16th of an inch. So I'm going to drill all of these blade entry holes. And then before I get into cutting this test pattern here, I want to show you the concepts of cutting with a scroll saw. The object in cutting with a scroll saw is to let the blade do the work. You don't want to be pushing and pushing this piece into the blade and deflecting or bending that blade. There should be no deflection in that particular blade. You are not, in essence, twisting the blade to get your cut, but you're rotating your piece on an axis in order to cut the curves that you desire. And a lot of people don't realize the um, extent that you can actually spin these blades in a piece. And to show you that, I'm just going to come in a little bit and spin it quickly and go back around just to show you how um, versatile this is when it comes to tight corners, depending on your blade selection and your stock. So for most applications, you want to put your saw at about 50% power. That's where I like to keep it. And um, you really don't need any more than that. All you're doing is overheating the blade. So you're not cutting any faster. So let me just show you how it is that you can actually spin this wood. And a lot of uh, beginners don't realize that capability. And then on a dime, you can spin it right back out. Spin it again if you like.
and you can get some really tight, tight, intricate cuts just by spinning that blade, but letting the blade do the work. There's no need to force it. You shouldn't be overheating the blade. The other thing you need to remember or to keep in mind is that there's such a thing as um, blade drift. And what that is, is if I cut, if I were to put a fence right here, and I were to push this blade or this piece of stock gently into that blade and start cutting, that blade would not cut straight. It just doesn't happen that way. Scroll saws have blade drift and they will veer off to one side or the other of that blade. No matter if it's a $50 scroll saw or a $2,000 scroll saw, that is the nature of the beast. So the entire time that you're trying to cut that straight line, you need to be steering and compensating ever so slightly as you go through to cut that line straight. You're not jamming it to the left or to the right, you're pivoting and you're pivoting so that your blade cutting edge will continue on that straight path. When cutting curves, you need to keep a couple things in mind. Those two things would be um, the feed rate versus your rotation of the stock. And while that sounds confusing, it's not that bad. What it is, is that if your feed rate, so the rate that you push this straight in, is greater than the amount that you're rotating, you're going to get a gentle sweeping curve. And let me just show you that. So my feed rate is faster, but my rotation is slower. And you see that we're getting a nice gentle curve there. You see that there? Faster feed rate, slower rotation. If you reverse that and your feed rate is slower than your um, rotation rate, you're going to get a tight corner. So feed rate, slow, rotation, quick. Now you see that there? So with the feed rate being slow and your rotation quick, you get a tight corner. Sweeping curve with a faster rotation and a slower, or sorry, a faster feed rate and a slower rotation. So how do you do a circle? Bottom line is with your circle, your feed rate and your rotation rate have to be the same. And I'm gonna to try to show you that by cutting out this circle. Again, there is no side-to-side -side pressure on the blade. It is strictly feed rate and rotating on the axis. There's no need to hurry. You don't need to go crazy. There's not a race. You see those guys online that they go absolutely nuts flying through these patterns and, you know, cutting at 500 miles an hour. What's the point of that? Scrolling is one of the most relaxing forms of woodworking. So why rush it? Just take your time, keep an eye on your line, and when cutting circles, remember your feed rate has to equal your rotation rate. I'll just clean up that one edge there. Just like that. And you can see that we've cut a circle. And that would be all the time we have for this week. Um, we've covered some of the basics here this week. And um, I know that for some of you, it might be either old hat 
or it might be boring or repetitious or a slow going show. And I understand that, but uh, on my show it's all about teaching people and showing people of all different levels. And sometimes uh, we need to take it down a little bit and help those that are just starting out. And I'm sure that for those who are beginning with scroll saw work and wanting to get into it and do it the right way, I'm sure that um, this particular video is going to help them immensely um, in learning to uh, acquire the skills they need to, to make the projects that they have in their mind. So guys, that's all the time we have. I want to thank you for joining me this week. And um, we're going to carry on next week, right where we left off from this week's show, uh, with part two of Scrolling for Beginners. And I'm going to see you then with yet another woodworking video.